So why do we need all these different types of data structures? Each type of data structure makes some types of searches easier and some types of changes easier. A lot of work goes into optimizing data structures to achieve the right trade-off between speed of the most important operations and the amount of space required in memory or on disk. So far we've studied data, mainly how the computer stores and retrieves data. It's time to switch our focus to control. Control structures tell the computer what to do next. The simplest control structure is the sequence. A sequence is a list of commands. You just move from one to the next. A branch is a decision point. The computer evaluates a logical expression and then does something different depending on whether the expression is true or false. For example, the expression might be x equals y. x equals y is true if x actually equals y. x equals y is false if x doesn't equal y. If x equals y, the program will do one thing. If x doesn't equal y, it'll do something else. That's a branch. A loop is a sequence that repeats. A function is a self-contained task that other parts of the program can use. For example, we could send a number to a square root function, and that function would return the square root of the number. Programmers work extensively with library functions. A library function is often supplied by somebody else. Allegedly, it's been thoroughly tested and it works. The library might come with your programming language, or you might buy a specialized library, like a graphics library. Exceptions are get me out of here commands. For example, if you're trying to write data to the disk but the disk crashes, the disk driver, that's the program that controls transfer of data to the disk, is going to stop trying to write data there and issue an exception. Some common exceptions that you probably run into include a divide by zero message, that comes as the program crashes, the out of memory message, which comes as the program crashes, and the general protection fault, which means that the program tried to write to the wrong area of memory, the operating system caught it and said, no, nah, you're going to crash. Notice the pattern here. There's an error. Either the program catches its own exceptions and deals with them, or it lets them go through and the operating system sees them. When the operating system sees an unhandled exception, it puts the program out of its misery. An exception can leave the program in a messy state. When an exception is thrown inside one method, but some other part of the program handles the exception, that part has no idea what happened inside the method. It doesn't know if the method was in the middle of the loop and whether it finished. It doesn't know if the method was storing data onto disk and finished. It doesn't know if the method had taken up a bunch of memory and released it to the operating system. All it knows is it got this exception. Now what is going to do with it? Exception handling that is not very skillfully managed causes a lot of hard to reproduce failures. An interrupt is just a signal that some kind of event has happened. There are hardware interrupts and there are software interrupts. In either case, the computer responds by stashing a few key pieces of data into temporary storage. For example, it stashes the current location of the currently running program. Then the computer runs an interrupt handler. The handler determines how to respond to the event that generated the interrupt. It deals with it, and then it restores control back to the main program, reloading all the temporary data. To the main program, it's as if nothing ever happened. But these background events, the events that are serviced by interrupts, might actually be critical to the program. For example, a printer might be taken offline just as the program is trying to print to it. Or a key piece of data might be changed just as the programmer is about to use it. So now that we've looked at storage and control, we can finally talk about coverage. The coverage question is this, how much have you tested? Coverage answers are usually proportions or percentages. I've tested half the code. I've tested all the printers. When programmers and computer science professors talk about coverage, usually they mean structural coverage. Structural coverage isn't the only approach to glass box coverage. Ammon and Offit, for example, provide a solid discussion of graph coverage. Paul Jorgensen gives a good introduction to data flow coverage. But the common discussions, including discussions in standards, focus on simple descriptions of the program's flow of control. That's structural coverage. So let's look at these first. You achieve 100% statement coverage if you test every statement in a program. If you look at this example, this little program, we can achieve 100% statement coverage with one test. You achieve branch coverage if you test every statement and every branch. In this little program, it takes two tests to achieve 100% branch coverage. Notice that for the variable b, we need two tests. One where b is hello, and one where b isn't. The reason is that if b is hello, the program does something special. If b is not hello, we're not going to execute the code that was written for hello. So it's a different branch. Now an amazing number of programmers and consultants talk as if we can achieve complete code coverage if we achieve 100% branch coverage. And this is ridiculous. 
From a structural point of view, the most glaring error in this reasoning comes from interrupts. Most programs are interrupt driven today. The operating system can shift control from your program to the interrupt handler at any time, any point in the program, for as long as it wants. There's an implicit branch from everywhere in your program out to the interrupt handler. The state of the system can change in ways that are important to you. The interrupt handler can change data on the disk, it can change data in memory, it can tie up resources that you're going to use, it can delay your processing so that other things happen before you're ready for them. These can all cause failures. They all have caused failures in systems I've worked on. So interrupts are branches. Now we can try to rationalize not counting them as branches by saying, well, by recognizing they're hard to test. And by saying, look, you can't see them in the code, so how can we call them branches? Besides, the programmer didn't intentionally write them as branches into the code. It's the operating system that makes them branch. Uh, okay, fine, we can say that these aren't the branches that we've got in mind when we talk about branch coverage. But don't call branch coverage complete coverage at that point. If there's a structural way in the code if there's a path you can take that's going to cause failures, you can't call it coverage if you're not going to test it. Continuing with structural coverage and ignoring interrupts, the next level up is multi-condition coverage. This checks all of the combinations of the logical expressions. We don't just check the true branch and the false branch for each individual expression, we check them together. So here we have two if statements. We can branch cover them with two tests, but multi-condition coverage requires four tests, all the combinations of trues and falses. Simple structural coverage measures are useful, but they're incomplete. Here's a simple example program that illustrates the problem. The program asks for two inputs, A and B, then it prints A divided by B. You can achieve 100% branch coverage of this program with one test. Give it two for A, one for B, it'll print a two. You're done. Well, almost done. What happens if you give it zero for B instead of one? You get a divide by zero. Structural testing is blind to any data values that aren't specifically checked by the program. There's no test for b equals zero. There's no branch for b equals zero. There's no code for b equals zero. So if you test b equals zero, it doesn't add any coverage. Error handling accounts for a high percentage of the code in many programs. The divide by zero bug that we just looked at is a simple example of the absence of error handling code. Tests designed to maximize structural coverage are blind to the absence of error detection and error handling. They won't notice if a program isn't designed to check whether a set of calculations will use up all of available memory, the program will crash out of memory instead. They won't notice a failure to detect that an incoming message has a huge data structure that will overrun the temporary storage area that receives messages. These temporary storage areas are called input buffers. Buffer overruns are the most commonly exploited security vulnerability in web applications. If you rely on structural coverage, you won't notice that you have no buffer protection code. You just get hacked. Tests designed to maximize structural coverage are blind to plenty of other risks, too. They won't notice that the program is unusably slow, incomprehensible, incapable of delivering promised benefits, or incompatible with widely used video cards. Branch coverage is useful. Nothing I say today should make you suspect that I think branch coverage is not useful. Programmers who have the discipline to achieve 100% branch coverage of the code they write probably find a lot more bugs than programmers who don't think about coverage when they do their testing. When I teach programming courses, I insist that my students learn to use a coverage monitor. I insist that they achieve high branch coverage. In my advanced course, students who don't do this get zeros on their assignments. For programmers, these tools are free or cheap, they're easy to get, and they help you find bugs. When you write code, you should use them. But some people try to encourage black box testers to use these tools as they run black box tests. There are expensive tools that can help with this. But as a black box tester, I've never found structural tools helpful. And I'm not sure that they lead me in the right directions. There are better kinds of coverage to work with as a black box tester.